Okay, um, welcome everyone to the Generative AI and Bioengineering panel. Uh, my name is Markus Bühler. I'm a professor of engineering at MIT, and um, my lab's working on generative AI in the context of materials, including biomaterials. We have a panel today of uh, some really interesting folks that are um, bringing that are bringing really an interesting industrial perspective and application perspective. We have Archit Kosla from Path AI um, and Hasib Khan from Google, and uh, I want to begin the panel of discussion today um, by asking both of them to introduce um, themselves and maybe say a few words about your role in your companies and what you're doing, and um, then we'll go from there. So, Archit, do you want to start? Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Archit Kosla. I'm a founding engineer, engineer and uh, currently a director of machine learning at Path AI. Um, it's a startup that aims to transform the domain of technology using machine learning and deep learning. Um, I've been at this company for six years since pretty much the beginning, and I um, am mostly focused in you know making machine learning algorithms faster uh, using you know algorithm improvements and um, you know using my background in software engineering. Um, I've worked a bunch on you know cancer related uh, projects, but also other um, projects like IBD. Um, and um, NASH, which are other diseases which typically um, are using pathology data. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about myself. Great, thank you. Um, Hasib, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. So, my name is Hasib. Uh, I am a senior ML engineer at uh, Google. I am also an official Google Generative AI ambassador. And um, I have a background in applied math and deep machine learning. Um, I'm passionate about cancer research. I have a bunch of work on genomics, uh, deep variant type gene sequencing back for technology and uh, hardware that accelerates genomics, hardware that stores genomics data efficiently. And uh, uh, yeah, so happy to be here and uh, talk about fun stuff. Sounds great. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, thank you both for being here. It's going to be fun to discuss. So first question, I think both of you are, you, know, like you have different kinds of companies, different kinds of settings, but I want to ask you both, um, when you work with your generative models or your models in general, how do you get your data? And uh, maybe you can both say a few words about potential issues there. I know that um, if you work in hospital settings, there might be, um, well, there might be confidentiality issues. Uh, there might be humans labeling data potentially and maybe there are other you know policy requirements or considerations so i'm gonna maybe ask Ajit first um, if you can say a few words about that yeah um so over the years uh we have actually developed multiple methods of collecting this data just because you know data is everything in machine learning so um, some of the sources in digital pathology are uh, open source data like pcga it's a massive um, database, uh, but often is limited to do something at a clinical level. Um, but we also actually have a, a lab that we own, um, which we had bought uh, in a year and a half ago, um, which is a regular lab that you use, um, which has a lot of sources of these pathology specific data that come in. Um, so we have access to data from there, but also working with other clients. Um, who might provide data uh, and so on. There's other commercial um, uh, sources that you can buy data from. Um, so this is just access to the raw images because that itself is hard to grasp. Um, second is actually collecting annotations or other variations. So in you know generative AI, you might be thinking about you know. Um, going from you know like in digital pathology a big problem is of stain normalization i.e the stain is something like um when you get a you know, biopsy or something that they, they into certain agents those can determine how dark or light and different variation that you might get so that's a big problem so and you know just different types of scanner different methods that go into the preparation of that image can cause a lot of variations so having access to your own lab and other, you know, source of data, we can actually get, you know, let's say the same image with different variations. Um, we create that 
data. Also, we have access to about 300 to 400 uh, both certified pathologists where we can do something closer to like a mechanical Turk, but at a more um, professional level where these people are both certified to, you know, provide data that we can actually trust um, and kind of go from there. So, um, yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, Hasib, I think you have a probably a little bit different setting where you work, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I like to think that uh, actually and, and uh, uh, people are, are a bit faster than us in responding to these things. Uh, we're a bit more cautious simply because uh, the, the compliance issues that you have to go through, you have to be very regulatory compliant. Uh, and uh, so uh, I wouldn't speak, get into like very fine details, but broadly speaking, uh, Google um, uses uh, for different kinds of healthcare analyses. We have open source data that's already available. But there's also uh, partnerships that Google has with different healthcare companies. And there's a well-documented partnerships um, within the framework frameworks of regulatory compliance. We're able to uh, analyze that data uh, in an anonymized fashion. So um, that's pretty much the two main sources of data that, that we have. And... Uh, Depending on yeah. where that, what kind of data we're looking at, uh, would depend on like what partner it is. So, for instance, if it's uh, uh, data from histopathology or uh, uh, chemical sample data, that's that would be with a different partner compared to something like gene samples uh, or population genomics, and that comes into different parts of the vertical of the organization. So, there's different verticals within Google that deal with separate data. They are combined into a health sciences org. But uh, yeah, there's this, those are kept as separate verticals. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so the, the, the current, there's currently a lot of activity, of course, in generative AI in general. Um, and this panel, of course, is going to, we're going to talk about generative AI and bioengineering. So we talked about data and it's quite interesting to see how we all get our data and, and how we, we you know, share the data or um, curate the data. But what do we actually, what do you generate? You know, what is the generative component in AI that we're, we're talking about today? Um, can you maybe give us a little bit of an idea? Um, it could be anything from data augmentation to generating, um, you know, entirely new solutions or new combinations or maybe generating, you know, lab conditions or patient examinations, things you haven't thought about maybe doing and maybe a human will make the experiment happen at the end. But can I talk a little about how you're using uh, generative AI. And then after that, in the next segment, I want to talk about the types of methods we're using. But for now, we'll just keep it at kind of what are we generating, actually? Yeah. Um, so there's plenty. There's, you know, the opportunities are limitless of generative AI. Um, it's still really early on, I would say, in this industry where, you know, the AI is getting good enough to be usable. Um, so a lot of the use cases might uh, for now be limited to augmentation during training um, so that you can train your model to be more robust across different domains uh, but now it's actually getting into generating images for just new training data for example creating um, situations that might be too rare and gathering that data might be too hard um, that domain itself is new but you know it's useful um, you know gathering data from you know all these sources that both of us have mentioned you might get the most prominent or common data and when you're thinking about those edge cases you might end up either paying a lot of data waiting a lot and or might never get it so these generative ais can actually help in those situations um, but as you can imagine you have to train something to be able to predict that and you know how do you get that data so it's a kind of a hard problem um, and um, yeah so I've only seen a few papers currently uh, which uh, are in process around this um, but I'm yet to see you know a full clinical application around this but I'm hopeful that you know something around that will be coming soon but would be curious to see you know uh, what things have in mind. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. Can I ask a quick follow up before we, you know, go on? Um, the so how good are these tools today? The algorithms, methods, 
it actually identifying entirely new, you know, let's say combinations of parameters or entirely new pathologies or situation scenarios. I mean, are they simply interpolating between what they've seen before, or are they actually, uh, is there some sort of sense intelligently putting together new, new ideas that we can then explore? Like you said, if we maybe generate a new, um, you know, set of parameters or combinations of parameters. So where are we in the spectrum, and where are we going to be? Maybe I don't know if you want to add to this. Yeah, real uh, quick. Yeah. So uh, I think for augmentation specification specific uh, problem, I think the models are fairly good. Um, depends obviously on the augmentation, but you are able to get a bunch going on because technically you are only kind of giving this model to its training and, you know, deep learning models often are decently robust to noise. So even if some things fail, overall, in my experience, you have seen that the final model is still pretty decent um, and kind of works, you know, across the augmentation you have uh, been training on. But if it's on a completely new thing that we are thinking about, um, let's say, you know, create this one instance using, you know, these few specifications, um, it's getting there. It's realistic to humanize, but to experts, they can identify some differences. Um, yeah. But even in that case, uh, some of the latest papers are doing fairly well compared to human people, uh, or humans, <laughs> and, yeah. you know, are at par. Um, but they have their limitations, like I said, that they are able to only do uh, what they've been trained on and on those combinations to go above and beyond um, is where it gets tricky. Um, so uh, hopefully soon, uh, but uh, yeah. let's see. No, it's not saying so. And then um, Haseeb, so what are you what are you generating? And maybe you can also throw in the discussion on kind of the the novelty of the data you're generating. It's something I'm very interested in to see, you know, what is the capacities models generalize instead of sampling again what we've seen, which is also useful, of course, but how how much um, sort of in, you know, novel innovation can we expect from these generative models? Well, so before I begin that answer, but that's a very, very loaded question. Um, the um, I, I should say that there is an amount that I can disclose, and then you know there is an amount that I I can't. So we the only stuff that I can talk about is what's kind of available in the public domain, uh, because remember one of our AIs became sentient a while ago. Uh, kidding, that's a joke. <laughs> it, it, it never became sentient, uh, but you know. So uh, within the realms of what's publicly available, we have um, we, our experience has been slightly uh, like. On the, on, on the other end of the spectrum, the, the generative models currently in existence do not generate, they generate data, they don't generate very high quality data unless you reduce the uh, problem from a Hilbert space problem to a um, n-dimensional definable problem where you have n parameters that the model is trying to reproduce accurately. Um, if you can reduce the total sample space or the output space of the problem to a given finite number of parameters and re reinforcement train on those parameters, then you get very good clinical level outputs. But without that reduction, you don't. And I can give you an example. So for instance, for uh, three-dimensional voxel data that is used to train DL models on ultra high resolution MRI images, um, as if you can look at uh, blood vessel sampling or curation or sp split dynamics for certain kinds of cancers, uh, which are a signatory because your blood vessels, like the capillaries, they split at different angles and at different rates. And that splitting changes when you have a microscopic cancer starting to emerge. Um, if you can reduce it to an angulation problem and down to its mathematical differences, the models will do robustly well at generating those samples. But if it's just a, a, a voxel-based output that you're trying to generate without that kind of derivation to like its core dimensions, then you have a, what we see like a very steep drop in the the performance of the generative models. And probably, I, I don't know, I mean, there's people that are smarter than me on this, but the um, it, it wouldn't be advisable to use that in a clinical evaluation uh, setting um, if, if you're not able to generate data to that level 
so so that's that's the issue and again of course if you you know anybody will tell you dl algorithms are garbage in garbage out so if your augmentation data is not clinically very refined you lose that uh, edge on accuracy and normally you can get good accuracy in the in, in models that are trained up trained on augmented data but it's about that last five ten percent that that really matters and it's the edge cases that are the difficult ones to identify so um so to get that right it, it's it's a science that is in its infancy the pipelines that we require to be able to generate these effectively and be able to maturely put that into a clinical setting or call it clinical level data i, I don't think we're there yet uh as, as an industry we're not just speaking about google just as an industry we're not there yet and i think i'd give it at least you know two or three years give or take before we start to really a knock on the door of hey this is really good data and an expert can look at it and be like oh yeah this is actually very good sample data so on this on this sort of next stage i want to talk um about the the types of methods or algorithms using we talked a lot about the data which is as we you know we all know it's critical um but there are also different sort of strategies and how we can actually conduct the generative task you know there are gans which i think some of you are using we have diffusion models we have transformer type architectures and we have a mix of all of these of course in some way or form so maybe if you can disclose i don't know how much you can say but if you can maybe generally talk about your um the algorithms the strategies and and where you see this field going you know what are the the areas where we need to maybe think about algorithmic improvements or considerations versus maybe more on the data side or maybe there's a sweet spot between them so i'm curious to hear about that and i'm sure many of the people listening today are quite quite interested as well as they go into their own domains and fields so i don't know who wants to start Archie, do you want to start or? yeah um i can try uh but i think this is again you know um like mentioned previously a bit of a sensitive topic just because everything's so new um i only certain things that you know are publicly available i would be discussing them um and you know psychogans are one of the most common things for you know image specific um image generation or transformation um typically if you notice uh, at least in the domain of digital pathology um similar to what was previously mentioned we have problems of you know um just scanning at different resolution those images can cause a lot of variation each scanner can cause many differences so i think mm -hmm. it is um you know the methods um typically do work okay out of the box right now um it is definitely how much computation you can provide first of all uh and that comes down to how much data you have um in our experience um you know if you are able to gather the data that you care about um in enough quantities a lot of the algorithms start to work fairly well and it kind of comes down to really just actually trying out what works best um i don't think i would be able to say that this that is better than this method because each um you know domain even in bio engineering could be from drug development could be radiology could be you know genomics could be digital pathology all might require something different um and honestly right now it's all about really trying it if you have access to the data and computation um and seeing what works um because you know this next one to two years is about you know when things are actually going from kind of proof of concepts to actually something usable and potentially you know pitching it to you know clinical use cases in future um yeah cool yeah um i see do you want to add a few things on like methods and you know strategies you see as much as you can share um as a trend i mean we all have seen all the news about recent developments of course um but there also a lot of there's a lot of debate about it and um I'm curious to hear especially for the healthcare and bioengineering field what are the what are the methods i think we should be paying attention to from your perspective yeah so uh diffusion models currently are doing reasonably well and the thing is google has a huge history um uh coordinating with institutes like stanford um uh, building 
these kind of generative models. So I'm sure you know, uh, this is common knowledge that the original GPT a generative pre-trained transformer model was developed by Google into, and the paper came out in 2018 yep. that really changed the vector of the, the way AI was perceived. Um, so there is newer kinds of models. There's a couple of papers out. There's control net type models. Uh, there's uh, dynamic diffusion models that are taking into account different kinds of dynamic masks that do dynamic learning. And uh, these are open source papers. I welcome everybody watching this to go and, get and read those. Uh, they're pretty well written. And uh, some of this will be effective. Some of that won't. I think it's too early to say because there has been an explosion in a bunch of these. We don't really know which ones for the large scale tests will be successful. I think it's a bit premature to say that. Uh, however, I will say that there is an effort being made by a bunch of labs um, across the Bay Area uh, in England. Um, and I think a couple of labs in uh, the APAC region, so Asia Pacific region, that are experimenting with diffusion models in multi spectrum. So right now, all diffusion models are RGB type models that are working on hue and red, blue, green type pixel diffusion. And for, for the most part, with some hue adjustments. And uh, that is now spilling over into multispectral domains. So you're looking at, uh, you know, um, scanning electron microscopy, X-ray type models, uh, and for other applications, uh, millimeter wave type radar uh, added or, or uh, uh, point cloud LIDAR mapped onto your standard RGB space. So there's a couple of those that are coming in. And I think that's a very exciting space because um, as you develop penetrative technology and a lot of modern medicine is built off of being able to see into the human body without damaging tissue. As you develop diffusion models for that, that really then opens up the world for this whole new uh, capability of being able to visualize disease and with very low sample data, being able to upsample it with reasonable degrees of accuracy, whereby even very small labs can upsample that data to develop very fascinating applications. Um, so with, without having access to the variety and the vastness of clinical data that you need. And uh, yeah, I think that that really excites me. So that I think is the, the, the vector. I think the, the algorithms that are specifically being used, yeah, some will be good, some will be bad, some will die out, some will serve well in certain conditions, others will do well in others. But I think the vector is kind of centered around the, uh, the ability to see, perceive, and regenerate that depth. Yep. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to sort of say, if you, we, we talked about what you can generate and how and, and all those things, but Let's say you go back into your industry, your clients, customers, or depending on who you work with, um, practitioners, medical doctors. What's your experience in if you go to your, your average medical doctor, even though he or she might be inclined to, of course, maybe works with you, um, you know, what's sort of the response you're getting? Um, and I'm really mainly talking about, I have the perspective in engineering, um, which is a, you know, if it's not patient centric, um, you know, people like to take more risks maybe in developing new material and testing that. But if you're dealing with patients, it's a different story. So uh, what's your experience in kind of um, going back and, and seeing practitioners and are they going to be inclined to using your tools? Are they going to push back and going to rely on legacy approaches? Um, is there like a ha aha moment by them that they say, wow, this is something I could do now that I couldn't do a year ago or two years ago. Um, maybe you can talk a little about that experience you might have, if you have it with yeah, folks on the ground, actually using the tools really at the, at the at bedside, essentially in the hospital, potentially. Um, actually, do you want to start with that? Yeah. So I think in the healthcare field, one thing, um, that I have realized is there's a very high momentum of everything. So basically if something is in motion, it tends to stay in that motion until, you know, something massive happens, uh, just because there's so much time and money that has been put in, say drug development, the, you know, tooling in hospitals. And, you know, that's why you might have noticed, you know, a lot of the machinery, even in hospitals is fairly old. It's not always state of the art. Uh, and it might be cheap to buy a new laptop, but still, you know, the softwares, the, you know, things they have worked through in the hospitals, um, on that 
old machines will take time and effort. And I think that's the biggest bottleneck. There's excitement for sure. Um, so there's a, a huge area of just research only um, use case as well uh, in healthcare where, you know, you may not be going directly to clinical, but spending time in research, um, which can become clinical in a future, I guess, years or generation yep. or whatever. Uh, so that itself has, you know, big use cases where you may be assisting, you may not be doing the final prediction of, you know, let's say cancer or seasonal cancer, you can assist someone. Uh, so there are many use cases where you may not have to go the final mile, but you can help them reach to that conclusion quicker. Um, but you will always be battling that momentum and, you know, some people and companies and hospitals are open to, you know, change those, some aren't. Um, so, um, yeah, in general, there's excitement. People are willing to use it. Um, they do question it quite a bit because especially if you go to, let's say on the doctor's side and not researchers, it's not always, depending on the application, it's not just about helping, but could be threatening as well. Right. Yeah. You know, will this replace my job? I think we're a bit far away from there, but you know, those kind of questions come up, uh, and, um, yeah. It's how you can portray your work is honestly uh, crucial. Yeah, great. Thank you. Hasib, do you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually agree with uh, most of what uh, Archie said because it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a bimodal distribution, really. There is the one end of that distribution where mm. people are extremely skeptical, uh, very reluctant to hop on the bandwagon of something that's new. And, and to be honest and to be fair, uh, I think that is how the you know, medical industry should work. You should be cautious about new technologies until they're tried, tested out, fully functional. Um, the issue that, uh, so I don't personally have experience in terms of dealing with um, uh, physicians from Google's perspective because we deal with large-scale companies mostly and in my personal practice, but uh, in my own consulting that I do separately, I do deal with and do focus groups um, with physicians and, and medical researchers. And there is more excitement on the part of medical researchers than there is on the part of physicians. Again, take this with a pinch of salt. This is just coming from me. Could be wrong about it. Uh, but yeah, there is that slight reluctance because the proof is in the pudding and medical literature tends to respond to X number of times has this cure worked for X number of patients. Um, mm -hmm. And until you, you get there, um, widespread adaption will lag behind. And, but it's also a chicken and egg problem because in order to get that widespread adaption, yep. you need to have the technology adapted in the first place. So it's a, uh, th that's kind of like, uh, so, so there is that momentum, but I think there's two ways to drive this market in the future. One would be a research centric perspective where the benefits of research and research tools trickle into regular, uh, usage. Or the other one could be regulatory, which is that because the technology for this exists, because the, um, device accuracy is so much greater, there might be a regulatory impetus from uh, lawmakers in uh, Washington to, you know, put that sort of thing in and be like, oh, well, this is a great technology. We should use it. Let's mandate the use of this technology. I'm sure there's others, but that's kind of like what um, at least my thinking on this is. So I'm going to follow up on this a little bit, the um, regulatory framework for this. And it might be, I don't know how much of this you can answer, but what's your take on, um, there's a lot of discussion right now, of course, on, on AI regulation and people are calling for, you know, everything from agencies to nothing, you know, but um, if you were to kind of in your area, what do you think is important to both provide some safety measures and some framework, but also allow for progress, which of course we want and um, what's the right balance and what are the, maybe if you can briefly both answer, um, what are the, what are the key aspects you think we should pay attention to at least? Um, yeah, I think it's a fairly complex domain, uh, which is also trying to catch up, uh, with, you know, everything that's happening. Um, 
AI itself is changing every day. So, you know, you, you need to have someone who is able to develop rules and regulations around, around it. Like if you had asked, you know, anyone about two, three years ago, besides the people who are working on, let's say, ChatGPT or something equivalent, you know, would we have something as accurate and, you know, good? Uh, answer probably be, we don't know, uh, and maybe not but we clearly have a lot of methods. And similarly with any other deep learning application, you know, there was always this question just before it was launched, will it work, will it not work? And over the years we have seen development. Um, same way that I think re regulatory bodies, we have seen that they have or are trying to add methods um, around this, you know, there are new um, codes for, you know, like insurance and stuff that's getting added uh, in a lot of these healthcare using AI uh, based methodologies. Um, so there's work, but, you know, it's again, like a chicken egg problem that you don't know what to shackle, you know, control for until you see it. And when you see it, you want the correct regulatory body to approve it. So, you know, it's kind of, uh, confusing problem. Um, and I think, you know, boards like FDA have some processes around this already. Um, and in some cases they are actually also pushing in processes, which can fast track a lot of these development. So, you know, mm -hmm. typically FDA is seen as this might take forever for us to push something, but there are other methods, uh, that they have, uh, launched or have had launched for, um, you know, um, software, uh, family, I think software of a medical device is the correct term, but yeah, you know, around that where you can actually develop things quicker as yeah. software or a product like AI, uh, without having to go through, you know, the full, um, uh, rigorous check. They have a smaller, quicker version that you can build on top of previous version. Um, so that has been quite helpful in the industry, but, um, yeah, there's definitely more you can do, especially around ethics. Um, and I think there are a few use cases that I've started seeing in, you know, publications where they explicitly talk about ethics around their data, how it was collected. Is it good enough distribution of their data, patient data approvals? So I think that all kind of needs to come together. Um, and, you know, currently, um, Ethics is a topic which definitely um, is upcoming, um, and I think would be quite interesting to see how that rolls up into mm -hmm. you know, all these regulatory decisions. Yeah, sounds, sounds great. Yeah, Nasib, if you can talk a little about your you know, perspective from Google, your own perspective on what you can share, and like what what should we pay attention to? I mean, it was very interesting actually what you shared, and especially how the regulatory bodies can actually help us get to the target quicker by, by understanding, working with them essentially. But yeah, there's a big push right now and, and we're not going to know what's going to come down to us. It's actually what's going to happen from DC. But I see, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, so this is my unofficial uh, personal perspective on this uh, that is kind of informed mm -hmm. by what's going on in the market. I would bifurcate the idea of ethics with regards to the current discussion to two streams. One would be AI uh, regulation or generative AI regulation when it comes to medical, uh, the medical field, and then the other one would be general generative AI. And uh, for once, I feel like that the generative AI and AI discussion when it comes to regulation for medicine is actually easier to do than is for the general consensus, especially because it's partially because the AI applications came into medicine a lot stronger, a lot quicker, a lot earlier. So there is some degree of regulation around that already. And so it's a means of just extending the same field. Data regulation already exists. Yeah. HIPAA compliance already exists. So it's, it's kind of right. easier on that uh, regard. Um, as far as the other part is concerned, that's a whole different ball game. You know, you, it's, it can create, it solves a lot of problems. Hey, you go to one website, you type in what you want. The website gives you what you need or oh, it's crawling the entire internet. But uh, the person that wrote the blog post for the specific peach cobbler recipe that you're looking for uh, now doesn't get to have people go to his website and look at his content. And because that doesn't happen, the website doesn't drive traffic, which then decreases the impetus for people to put 
new content on there. So then it's like, okay, but if you discourage people for, from being creative because they don't get rewarded for it, then people will stop being creative. Uh, so then you're back into uh, Soviet Russia times. So you're decreasing the amount of creativity that you reward. And I, I personally have this perspective that you should always reward creativity. That is the driver of all innovation in the society. Um, but yeah, so I, th I think it would be wise to, to, to separate those two out to, into like the specific medical regulation versus the, the other. Um, in terms of generative data, I think the regulation, uh, generative data for healthcare, I think the regulation, for instance, would come into fields like what is the threshold for clinically viable generated data? Uh, I think that's a very pertinent question and a very important one. Uh, I had a discussion with a couple of Stanford professors uh, and my own advisor from back in the day uh, about uh, that sort of regulation. And they're like, well, there's, there's different thresholds and these would have to be different. And the, the framework for that is, is not very existent as of yet. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to those guidelines coming out. I'm not even sure uh, what the government body is for, for that or if we even have one back to uh, our chief's point. So, uh, yeah. It's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a better answer. No, thank you. No, it's great. It's great. I'm wonderful. Um, quick yes or no um, answer, maybe, um, is should we pause? There's been a letter signed by a bunch of people, um, pause the development of large models, large LLM, well, LLMs, I think, particularly, but also other, perhaps other generative models. Um, do you think that's a good idea? Necessary? Yes or no? If you can answer. <laughs> It's just an opinion, but I would be on the side of no, uh, because again, you know, like as you said, I think creativity should be rewarded, and this mm -hmm. is creativity, um, and I also agree with it. Um, we do need to add checks and balances around, you know, usability, ethics, um, and you know, be considerate about here's an awesome uh, technology that is getting launched, you know, which should instead of getting launched publicly before it needs to be, um, you know, uh, guarded by, you know, safeguards, for example. Um, you know, I think those are problems we should be working on. And I believe by saying yes, we will hinder creativity instead of actually solving for problems that we should be. Because if it's not this, it might be something else. It might mm. be, you know, some other uh, newer technology, which may not be generative AI, but some other AI, which will run into this problem. So are we saying, you know, don't innovate, don't improve, don't be modern. So that's my, you know, okay. opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Hasib, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I have a complicated perspective on this, so I'll say that up front. And it's, it's somewhat to do with the, the intellectual argument and I'll come to that in a second, but it's more to do with, I know people on both sides of the spectrum that are leading the debate. So. Uh, on the one hand, I, uh, this Professor Andrew Eng, who uh, has been a great guy for a bunch of my classes uh, while I was an undergrad. So uh, he is on the side of, hey, absolutely not, nothing happening. And then uh, Dr. Jan LeCun uh, from FAIR, uh, who I respect a lot. But then there is uh, uh, Mr. Musk, who is on the other end of the spectrum, which is like, no, we really need this. So. Uh, and he's also an inspiration to myself. So it's, it's one of those things where very smart people are seeing very diverging things. So I did a little thought experiment a couple of weeks ago with uh, friends of mine. And what we came up with was, well, why are these people coming up with really vastly different opinions? And what we think is happening is they're looking at different set of facts. So we think people in research, AI research specifically, uh, and academia are looking at the priority of being able to develop the technology and the fact that the technology is really good or it's not all there. So, for instance, I've heard uh, Dr. Lacoon talk about um, AI or specifically generative AI of the kind that we're using right now, like auto-encoding models, auto-regressive encoders. Uh, they, uh, they're basically fancy text producers. They, they, they regressively produce text. And so you get fascinating outcomes if you reinforcement, if you use reinforcement learning with humans in the loop to uptrain these, but, but they're at the end of the day, those kinds of models. So nothing to worry about. But I think the perspective that, uh, Mr. Musk is coming from is, is the other side, which is, Hey, these have very vast reaching real life consequences for 
both the job market, the the actual financial industry, the way we operate our economies, and this is happening way too fast, way too quickly. And w- when you look at it from that regulatory perspective, from the perspective of how businesses are going to manage these things and the economics of it, it's a different set of circumstances. So depending on what you value, do you value speed of research versus do you value stabilization in the economy? Um, I think that's the spectrum that you're trying to decipher at. And that might not be uh, um, a, a completely orthogonal game. You, you might be able to, or a mutually exclusive outcome, you might be able to find a nice little middle way. Um, maybe it is that we don't need to pause all AI research, but maybe we pause certain types of AI research. Um, and uh, maybe we wait for certain regulation on certain kinds of things, or maybe we wait for data regulation of certain types before we proceed with using that data, like open web scraping data from everybody's blogs that they've put very hard amounts of uh, hard work mm-hmm. uh, hours into and, and, you know, earning money from that. So it, it, it kind of is a, is a nuanced answer. I think it lies somewhere in the middle. So that, and that's, I know it's a very long-winded way of answering that question, but that's genuinely what I believe. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. Yeah, I think even here at MIT, we have obviously diverging opinions from different people and different perspectives. I, I want to. I think we're kind of close to the end in terms of time, unfortunately. But it was a fascinating discussion. The last question I want to put to both of you. So I work in academia, and and of course, the the research in computer science and in applications of CS and domains and deep learning has really changed in a way we have done things in the past 10, 20, 30 years into now. I mean, we're seeing a lot of companies like Google, Facebook, and, and others, OpenAI, you know, doing a lot of really fundamental work. Like you mentioned earlier, Google published one of the first papers in this field and have sort of spearheaded a lot of the discussion and development. Um, a lot of these things are, are changing. You know, they're not happening necessarily at universities, even though well, folks from universities are involved, of course. Um, and so my question is, um, as an educator, as a researcher, of course, but also an educator, I'm always sort of asking the question myself, um, are we educating the students in the way that they kind of be well prepared to come to work for companies like yours um, or go out in the world? Um, you know, what's your perspective and how educationally and, and what students learn as undergrad or grad students, how is that changing? And how do you look at graduates, let's say from MIT or Stanford, places like that, or other places, um, uh, what are you looking for? And do you see a trend? You know, if you want to tell us, what should we pay attention to as educators that you we need to do the students? I mean, is it domain knowledge, which I think you, both of you are strong in domain, but also in the computer science aspects? Um, is it that they need more of that? Do they need more algorithmic, fundamental math, discrete math? What do they need to the students today? Yeah, um, I think you are best suited, honestly, to answer that question, um, being, you know, um, still closely related to the field. But um, I think, uh, at least from my experience, I have seen that, you know, uh, colleges are uh, adapting to all of these changes really quickly, which I was very uh, impressed by. So, for example, Mm -hmm. when I was in my undergrad, um, freshman year, sophomore year, there were too much buzz about you know, deep learning or machine learning. Machine learning was still naive, you know, TensorFlow and stuff didn't exist. Um, so it's really hard for individuals to do complicated things. Um, but by the last year, there were a bunch of courses that had started coming up. And, you know, a similar domain of, you know, data science, which, you know, in the last few years went from, you know, being something to getting picked significantly. And, you know, you, I have seen, you know, many colleges starting to add like a full program just focused on data mm-hmm. science, um, which, you know, you know, has some differences from let's say computer science, which might be traditionally talking about, you know, front end framework, web stacks, which may not fully be relevant to let's say a data science degree. So they have been able to create those paths. And I think, you know, colleges will have to keep up somehow uh, or make dynamic uh, electives, I would say, which, uh, I was happy that, you know, some of them existed in my time um, to be able to pick up, you know, latest technology. Um, But to answer the other part of the question, I think basics are also super crucial. So if it's, you know, the basic math that goes into um, how do you build this, it's crucial. You know, and that's why there's two kind of approaches of practical versus non-practical. And it always has to be, 
well, not practical, sorry, theoretical, um, but it has to be a balance between those two where, you know, if you only focus on one, you will miss the other and gaps start to show up. And, you know, being in industry after hiring so many people, you know, the people in my perspective who have done best have kind of a balance of both. Um, mm -hmm. Understand the practical use case of the theory and can back up their practical use case of bio theory when needed. Um, so, yeah, that's my yeah. thought around it. But again, I have not been part of, you know, the education industry for a little bit. So, um, yeah. yeah, no, that's great. No, I mean, my question was really, yeah, from your perspective, you know, I mean, I think we, you know, we want to produce students that can perform. And I yeah, agree with most of the things you said. I think the fundamentals are important and being able to back up what you're doing and not just chasing the latest trend. And you, you're going to maybe in 10 years from now, we're going to have a different conversation uh, about totally different topics. So, um, yeah, um, let's see, do you want to add a few things? Uh, I'm pretty sure you have a very broad perspective at Google in terms of who you hire and why you're hiring them and what they need to know. Yeah, uh, I mean, honestly, the, the, the perspective varies on, and mine's going to be an unpopular one. So, but, but, the thing is, it's it depends on the position that you apply for, the team that you're applying for. They're looking for slightly different flavors of different things. Um, but uh, one thing that I will emphasize is that uh, because before Google, I used to work at Facebook, uh, Meta now, and uh, it's uh, strong fundamentals are always very important. So strong fundamental knowledge of math, uh, again, like you said, uh, specifically discrete math concepts or uh, proof writing, uh, the ability to understand uh, functional analysis, uh, real analysis. I would very strongly advise anybody that's trying to go into computer science should take at least introduction to real analysis courses. Uh, maybe some maybe some deep linear algebra as well, because if you're specifically going into machine learning, yep. that's going to be fairly important. Uh, because it's hard to learn it backwards. So it's, it's oh, always yeah. easier to learn it forwards if you have that background. Um, inferential statistics is very important because without it, you will have basically shot yourself in the foot for times to come. So basic inferential statistics, advanced inferential statistics, and a little bit of knowledge about physics won't hurt given that quantum computing and quantum machine learning is something that's going to uh, be coming sooner than you think um so that that's sort of, and we can have a separate session on that altogether so th that's uh you know i think that would not hurt uh, fundamentally strong understanding of physics um is going to be become more and more important as we move forward and yeah i think those really gear you for success because there will be different machine learning courses uh, as you're probably familiar with more than i am uh, on new topics that are emerging. It's easy enough for uh, universities to come up with courses, package stuff together and have that out as, as Archie suggested as electives, but the core concepts remain the same and emphasis on understanding those core fundamentals is is very, uh, is, is deeply important. Some of the most brilliant people that I've met at Google and at Facebook have been software engineers that can tell you why something won't work because it boils down to that specific computation on that specific thread and that won't execute this way. So, and that comes from, yeah. you can immediately tell that this person has very strong fundamentals. So, and those are the people you want to listen yeah. to. So. No, it's f fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's great. I, I want to thank you both, um, Ajit Kosa and Hasid Khan, um, Path AI, Google respectively. So thank you both again for participating and um, I hope to um, see you soon again and um, we're looking forward to all the questions coming in on Slack. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you so much, Marcus. Appreciate it.